Hi, and welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. I'm Robert Bryce. I'm the host of this podcast. We talk about energy, power, innovation, and politics. Um, and we're continuing um, Indian Point Blackout Week uh, to mark the closure, the premature, drastically premature closure of the Indian Point Energy Center in Buchanan, New York. And I'm happy to welcome uh, Madeline, I'm sorry, I'm happy to welcome Madison Cherwinski. She is the executive director of the Campaign for a Green Nuclear Deal. Madison, welcome to the Power Hungry Podcast. Thanks, Robert. Thanks for having me. I know we've been talking about doing this for a while, so it's good to finally chat. So, Madison, I didn't warn you, but I ask all my guests to introduce themselves. So if you don't mind, I gave your title, but uh, if you just arrived at uh, an event and you don't know anyone there, dinner party, say, and you have 30 or 45 seconds to introduce yourself, go. Sure. So in 2017, I started my uh, career as a pro-nuclear environmentalist and advocate going around the world talking to journalists and policymakers about the need for nuclear for both lifting people out of poverty and environmental protection. And then last year when I was sitting around at the beginning of the coronavirus, you know, I sort of realized that this was a crisis that required society scale action and suddenly a new economic strategy of reindustrialization around nuclear and manufacturing felt very possible. So I decided to launch the Campaign for a Green Nuclear Deal, which is a nationwide advocacy effort to articulate a new vision for Made in America Nuclear to deliver clean electricity, good high paying jobs and uh, rebuild American manufacturing. That's a good pitch. Thank you. Um, so, uh, and, and, uh, people interested in the campaign for a green nuclear deal, uh, gndcampaign.org, I'm assuming now we didn't talk yeah. about your call to action, but I'm assuming that's what you want people to do. Okay. So we have that out of the way. I'm going to start with the key question here. Why, w why was, uh, Indian point closed? Uh, why did it close last Friday? There are only two reasons why Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant would be closed given the situation and it's money and it's politics. This was, and let me be clear, when I say money, I'm not meaning economics. Indian Point was a profitable plant. So any concerns about environmental protection, public safety were just complete lies. Um, this was a purely political closure at the state level. So I want to touch on that because when I spoke with Mayor Knickerbocker, she said that this was the, the, the in her view, the, one of the main reasons this plant was closed was because the anti-nuclear groups, what did she say, stoked the fear uh, that the plant was going to blow up and kill all of us. I'm pretty, I'm paraphrasing what she said, but only slightly. So you're saying the same, that the plant was closed by uh, 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 so-called green groups. I'm putting those in quotes now because I, I don't believe they're environmental groups. You're saying that those groups, prima that they, well, uh, ha what was that role and who who is responsible? I, I remember Jessica Mitford said, you may not be able to change the world, but you can at least embarrass the guilty. Who are the guilty? Sure. I mean, yeah, Mayor Knickerbocker is absolutely right. It was green groups, including the NRDC, Sierra Club, most notably Riverkeeper, but beyond that, it's important to call out the elected officials and the public servants who purposely misled the public about public safety concerns and environmental harm. I think they should be held to an even higher standard. So, you know, frankly, I think what Governor Cuomo did to sell Indian Point down the river is um, an abuse of his office and frankly, a squandering of the public wealth that the state of New York had. Sold Indian Point down the river. I, I hadn't put it that way, but after being- Technically an estuary, <laughs> but yes. Well, so what was the motivation? I mean, what, you know, I understand Cuomo was, in fact, he it, to the end, he said, oh, well, this point, this plant would be closed, but it was so close to the biggest, you know, most densely populated city in the world, which wasn't true, right? He was quoted saying that that's not true. There are a lot of other locations in the world that are more densely populated, but past the point of, be <laughs> of believing much of what the governor says, particularly in, in the wake of the, the coronavirus but what's the 
I understood from your your speech on Friday in Buchanan at the what Mark Nelson called the funeral for Indian Point that you you use the word corruption. Is that true? I mean, yeah, I I don't want to try to speculate beyond um, what I know um, about the reasons. I, what just looking at the facts, like. It wasn't a surprise that Indian Point, if it were closed, would be replaced by natural gas. That's true. Um, it now, wasn't now just to interrupt, if I may, because Riverkeeper said over and over, oh, no, this plant won't be replaced by natural gas. No, 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 no. We're going to replace it with renewables and efficiency. And on their letter to the editor of The New York Times, uh, April 13th, uh, Paul Galay from Riverkeeper and Kit Kennedy from the NRDC said, oh, well, the, the output of, of Indian Point's already been replaced by efficiency and renewables and we really don't need it. What did you? Uh, I mean, that's just a blatant lie. Like we've seen natural gas. Um, combustion rise and emissions go up with the shuttering of Indian Point 2. So again, at worst, it's an outright lie. At best, they're doing some sort of nifty accounting trick to try to mislead the public. But I, I mean, I don't know. Maybe it's that uh, Cuomo's dad who famously got a nuclear plant canceled in New York. He had uh, some sort of needing to be better than his dad and wanted to kill two reactors. I'm not really sure. At best, he was complicit. At worst, it was corruption. And, and I'm not sure what else to say about it. There, There is no reason, technical, economical, or otherwise, that this plant shouldn't have gone on to operate for at least 40 more years. Well, so let's talk about that because that was one of the issues that I've heard over and over. Oh, well, these plants, they you know, they, you know, they get old, they have to retire. But when I was touring the plant with uh, the Intergy team, including Brian Van Gore and Jerry Nappy, Brian told me, he said uh, he was amazed and he worked there for a very long time, 40 years or more, that how well designed the plant was and that they're, they had recently got an ex a license extension. So can you expand on that? Because that, that idea of the plant being able to continue to produce electricity and, and also it being such a critical port of, a part of, of the electricity mix for New York City, <clears throat> those are the parts to me that, again, if you just say, well, I don't care about climate change, I don't care about land use. Well, what about resiliency and the uh, assurance of, of reliable electricity for New York City? How do you uh, can you tr address that? How do you think about that? Those issues? Right. I mean, there are nuclear plants around the country and even around the world of similar vintage and design and age that are seeing their licenses extended to 80 years and beyond. Now the NRC is looking at possibly life extensions out to 120 years with 40 year life extension intervals. Clearly, these reactors are aging extremely well and with proper maintenance and part replacement. I don't know that we know that there's a technical limitation to how long these plants can operate or if there is some sort of end date for our large light water reactors. So anyone saying that this plant was just old and it needed to go is just completely ahistorical and counter to what we're seeing at our nuclear plants around the country. Well, so then, well then, so what, what was the payoff? I mean, what do these groups get for closing this plant what's the payoff that's the part that i don't quite understand what's the is it just about being I, well okay let, let's let's talk about the tweet that natural resources defense council put out last friday on april the afternoon of april 30th when the when the plant was beginning to be shut down right. they essentially were gloating and i you know i've i've been writing about politics and the environment for a long time and i read that and i was just gobsmacked by the arrogance of it i mean how and i'm be you know I'm, i again want to hear your views and i'm not here to confess everything about what i see but what how did you read that i mean trying hard to maintain my composure right now but it was not something easy to see especially after such a devastating day hearing you know union reps and um community members talk about their grief and losing this plant and their fear for their future. And then to see an environmental group that has 
a budget of hundreds of millions of dollars every year that claims to care about decarbonization and climate change, gloating that they were able to shorten the life of this nuclear plant drastically, downstate New York's largest source of carbon-free electricity. It's just absolutely unconscionable. And, and, and it's not just New York, right? I mean, they were responsible in part for the closure, well, the pending closure of Diablo Canyon in 2025. They're active right now in my state of Illinois trying to um, see through the closure of Byron and Dresden by the end of the year. So again, I, I hate to speculate, but whatever the intention behind this is, it's certainly not decarbonization. It's certainly not environmental protection, and it's not a concern for human welfare. So uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. That's a really good point. Whatever the point of it is, it's saying that again. It's not decarbonization. It's not. It's not environmental protection. It's not caring for human human needs. It's just a power play. It's just a rank politics. I, that's what I'm trying to understand I mean, here. Yeah, I I think about it a lot because I I'm extremely frustrated and I want to know what it is. Part of me thinks is it you know this sort of Cold War era anti-nuclearism that's just really baked in and there just hasn't been a critical reevaluation of those positions. Is it more of in a 50 years? They haven't given it a rethought. That's that's <laughs> generous. I know. I'm trying I like to give people the benefit of the doubt, though that it's very hard in this situation. I will admit. Okay, 30, 30 years. Okay, since the Berlin Wall fell, what was it, 91? So okay, only 30 <laughs> years. So let's if you give them the benefit of the doubt. Okay, so but 30 so, years, I mean, they got other things to do. Right. That's that's charitable. Um, another thing that I worry is that there's this sort of pervasive idea of degrowth in the environmental movement, that humans are really bad for nature and that in order to protect nature, we need to do with less, use less, and in general, like have less humans, um, which is just a not true based on the data we're seeing from you know countries that are able to economically develop and decouple their emissions from that development but also it's just like really underestimating the ability of of humans to rise to the occasion and like tackle problems while also like delivering prosperity it's just it's this idea like this artificial um, ecological restraint that really concerns me. And I think that's still pretty prevalent in environmental groups and on the left in general. I, yeah, I, I tend to agree that this degrowth idea that, oh, that we have too many, we need fewer people, we, we're, we're, eating, we're, we're eating too much, we're, we're driving too much, we need to, right. you know, sit more in our loincloths and consider ourselves <laughs> and, and, right. and think, no, I mean, I, I but yeah, that's the essence no. of it. Well, oh no, you're watching too much television or you're using too much electricity. And my response is, no, I'm using just the right amount of energy. All the rest of y'all, you all are using too much. I'm just using the right amount. So leave me alone with your degrowth. Right. But I think, but, but it, that's what I've seen from, frankly, from Bill McKibben, from, you know, some of the leading environmentalists in America, this idea that, oh, we have to live simpler lives and that that's so it, is that one of your 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 beliefs at this point that that's what's driving some of this because you're talking about some of the biggest and mo most the biggest and wealthiest uh, green groups in the United States with this kind of agenda that's a it's a it's almost hard to fathom but that's is is that what you're you're thinking your contention I mean I I think that's certainly part of it I don't want to generalize and say everyone who sure. like participate or thinks this way but i definitely think that's part of or still remains in the environmental movement even to this day and and particularly you know, as it pertains to nuclear oh absolutely and and i mean you can see it in the environmental groups who work to prevent the construction of nuclear power plants in the developing world where electricity access is still 
Very low. Yeah. Very low. Um, there's little economic growth. And they're very happy to say, no, 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 no not nuclear. Um, we'll install some solar some, panels. Right. And, and I just, and that worries me. I think in the U.S. we have, we're very wealthy. We have a good chunk of margin for error. Clearly the stakes are very high. I mean, Texas, 200 dead, $200 billion, not acceptable. But when you're talking about develop the developing world, these groups are resigning people to poverty. I, I can't read it as anything other than that. So... So let me let me interrupt you if you don't mind, and and, and this isn't yeah. one of the the questions I've I've written down here, but um, I'm 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 guessing you're in your twenties or thirties, and you're and you're and you're really passionate about this. Why do you care so much? I mean, because I can hear it in your voice, and I I care. But what's the what drives you on this? I mean, because you 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 live in Chicago, right? And you went mm -hmm. all the way to Buchanan, New York, on the last day of the plant operation. It's not a small trip. It's not a, not easy. It's not you know. It's certainly not free. Mm -hmm. Why did you go and why do you care about this so much? Why to 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 start this campaign for the green nuclear deal? Well, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I got started with nuclear when I was in college, and I just had this sort of. I was born. I knew I wanted to make as big of a material impact for good as possible when I went out into the world. And I wasn't sure if that was going to be through tackling climate change issues or um, working to alleviate poverty across the world. And I found nuclear and suddenly these two pieces fit together just perfectly where you don't have to sacrifice environmental protection to lift all boats and bring people into prosperous, healthy, fulfilled lives. So that's what got me started in nuclear. And then as I've been traveling around the world and, and around the country, going to these communities, it's just, I don't think anyone really has an idea until you talk to the people that work at the plant and the communities that are driven by the plants tax revenues and like it is their life it's the lifeblood of these communities it's so much bigger than just you know a place where people work they're like cathedrals of a clean and prosperous future that we can all have so i just thought i i i, I like that cathedral because that was i mean and I'm sorry to interrupt, but when 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 I was in the turbine hall at Unit Two, it was almost exactly three years ago. I think we were there May 10th of 2018. I was just I was really gobsmacked by the one the scale of the thing, right? And that it was just a marvel of technology, and that it was being consigned to the ash heap. And I thought it then, and I think it even more now for no good reason, really, no good reason, except this. I think it comes down to this excessive fear of nuclear and this idea that oh we should live simpler and the technology that oh it's too much technology we need oh only solar and wind because they're lower technology right or, or i i don't know it was it, it but you it's it sounds like you, you've taken it personally that you feel personally insulted somehow is that is that is that a correct read of what you what i see or what i hear yeah i mean part of it is at a personal level like this is my country. I have a lot of pride in what we have. And we have this progressive inheritance of, of a wonderful world-class nuclear fleet that we are absolutely squandering for no good reason. So, you know, just for, for me, my children, my grandchildren, that I think is an outrage. And then Back to your point, I had the privilege of visiting um, Hinkley Point C in 2019. And I actually got a tour and got to walk out onto the base mat. And I got really emotional, which is funny. You're looking at a bunch of wells and, and like it's, it's an industrial construction site. But I was just thinking like there's going to be generations of families working here if if all goes right this plant is going to be there long after i'm gone powering the future like it, it's it really is beautiful 
it, I think uh, this sort of beautiful nuclear is the thing that's powering this beautiful, prosperous tomorrow. Um, so I'm really, really mad and I'm going to continue. Hopefully Indian Point is our last closure. Um, the fight certainly continues, but if I have to attend each and every one of these plant funerals, I will, because it's that important. It's important to the communities and it's important because other plants are going to continuously be under threat until we can put a stop to it. I like how you describe that. Uh, the, uh, the absolute the world-class nuclear fleet we are absolutely squandering, and I think that that's exactly it. And I, I just add one quick thought to your, you know, to what you the the way you described it, which I thought was really it's, it's great. Um, but what are they providing? They're providing electricity. It's not like they're making like widgets or you know. Uh, I don't know, the sledgehammers. No, they're bringing the juice that drives everything we care about, they, that they bring, that, that that liberates women and girls from the pump, the stove, and the wash tub. That, that, you're, that legacy that you were talking about, I thought you were gonna talk about rural electrification because that's the other part of the government legacy that is in the 30s, the, you know, the, Civic-minded politicians, Sam Rayburn and 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 George Norris and 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 Burton Wheeler and 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 Roosevelt and uh, Franklin. So no, we need to make sure everyone has electricity. This is important for everyone, right? And we, this is the role of government to reach out and make that happen. And that's where I guess was this a government failure? In part, absolutely. I mean, you don't have, like you said, you don't have modern society without electricity. It is a necessary public good. So the fact that no one stepped in to stop this closure, again, it's it's um, an abject failure of duty. It's a dereliction, a dereliction of duty, um, particularly at the federal level. I mean, we're seeing these closures in, you know, Illinois, California, New York, historically Vermont, um, New Jersey has been fighting to keep its nuclear plants afloat. I mean, at some point, if an administration cares about climate progress, if we care about being a leader in this critical technology in the world and building it for our current and potential allies, why are we allowing it to be shut down? Why isn't someone stepping in? It's a lot of talk. It's a lot of, oh, our current nuclear fleet is important by Indian point. You know, oh, um, advanced nuclear fuels that are tested in um clinton new uh nuclear plant in illinois are going to pave the way for the future but see a byron and dresden like why why aren't we stepping in i, I again i'm in complete agreement with you and I, I was just stunned that the president biden on his on his on his joint session of congress address on wednesday night talked about climate change he gives a shout out to electric vehicles and batteries is a shout out to wind energy not a did not use the words nuclear energy one time Instead of nuclear weapons, nuclear proliferation, North Korea, nuclear program, not a single mention of nuclear energy. And I just like, wait a minute. You, I mean, I don't know. I'm starting to think some of these people, they're flat earthers. Oh, we're going to solve all this with, with, with renewables. No, you're not. You can't do it. And that's the part that is, is disappointing. But again, I, I don't, you, we agree on these things. So give me your vision then. So your, this, your idea about industrializing America, rebirth of American industry based around nuclear, there's a lot of different ideas about that, right? About how you achieve, you can, because it's a fabrication business, right? You got to build a lot of these things and it's got to be, you know, not by the ones and twosies. You, it's not like Plant Vogel where you make two, one, two big ones and then you, you know, and you forget how to build them and then you learn again in another five or 10 years. Right. So what, what do you see that? I, I talked to a, a few people who talk about Kirsty Gogan and Eric Ingersoll about shipyard fabrication of reactors. What, how do you see this? What, give, me, give me your blue sky uh, uh, scenario for how that reindustrialization or an industrialization of America built around nuclear. What would that look like? And is, sure. is government going to have to lead that? Sure. Well, first of all, I totally agree with you. I say it's a little cheeky, but you know, the U.S. cannot afford to build one more AP-1000 in this country, but we could afford to build 50 more, you know, <laughs> it's, um, I it, like it's that. that's <laughs> funny. I like that. Good. Right. So beyond like the very bare minimum, like 
bare minimum is protecting all of our existing nuclear plants. But then as we start to get into more blue sky thinking, the first step is to making is making a commitment to growing the industry. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be led by the government in terms of, oh, we're going to build a state owned um, manufacturer or champion that's going to deliver this sort of like Russia or China. But we just need a commitment that the U.S. is committed to growing its share of electricity from nuclear. Um, then it comes, it, uh, the next step is sort of identifying and supporting or building a national champion firm who can do this. Um, well, let, let me stop you best... if you don't mind, because that's it seems to me that that's one of the real hurdles. And I'm just being honest with you here. I'm adamantly pro-nuclear. Yeah. You know, if you anti-CO2 and anti-nuclear, you're pro-blackout. That's my line. I've used that line a long time, and I believe it still. But mm -hmm. the U.S. grid, it's one of the, I think it's one of its strengths and one of its weaknesses is very balkanized. There are a lot of owners. So you're saying, I just want to be clear, and I'm not arguing with you, but I, I think, and maybe you're probably right, if, if we're going to have that robust nuclear sector, we're going to have to have much more government, federal government involvement in the procurement and deployment. That is, 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 that, is that your view as well? Absolutely. I think at a bare minimum, it's backing um, loans for, and, you know, a lot of it is politics. Uh, what, what company or utility is going to invest in a potentially $20 billion project if the state can just elect a crooked governor that decides it's going to turn it off after two years? You know, so there has to be some level of actual commitment that they can rely on. Um, there should be green bonds issued that have the full backing of the U.S. government to do this. Um, you know, look at the TVA. They've delivered the only nuclear reactor in the 21st century until Vogel comes online. They've invested in their nuclear plants, um, I think getting up rates of like 13%. So they're one of the cleanest utilities in the country, and it's because of their nuclear. You know, I think they have maybe 13 solar farms and one wind farm. When the public is, when a public utility is charged with delivering reliable, cheap, clean electricity, it does nuclear. That's what we've seen. So I think there is a good question about how much government is involved but certainly the government has to step in at this point because the systems we've created particularly in the rtos as you've talked about with meredith just does not incentivize anti-fragile reliable electricity and that's unacceptable you know, I like that point about the, the and Dr. Chris Kiefer calls it the fragilization of the grid. And that's what I fear it really when it comes to New York is this fragilization. And to, and to refer back to Meredith, and it was, I wrote this piece in Forbes last uh, Thursday, uh, right the day before the, the plant closed, was that it's going to make New York more subject to the fatal trifecta, more reliance on imports, renewables, and just-in-time gas. And it, what we saw in Texas, and I was blacked out for 45 hours, what was the most reliable, what was the most resilient form of generation? It was the nuclear plants. Hello. And yet they right. closed and, and yet the, the New Indian Point is closing and in, in, in New York and in California, they're planning to close Diablo Canyon. Um, so my guest is, Mad is Madison Cherwinski. She is the executive director of the campaign for a green nuclear deal. You can catch up with all of their doings at gndcampaign.org. And you're on Twitter too, right? I've, I don't have your Twitter handle written out here. Yep, it's just Maddie, M-A-D-I underscore, and then my last name, which Sirwinski. Sirwinski, C-Z-E-R-W-I-N-S-K-I. You got it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tricky one. I don't wish it on anyone. No, no that's okay. Maddie underscore Cherwinski um, uh, on Twitter, at Maddie underscore Cherwinski. Um, she is the executive director, campaign for a green nuclear deal. You find them on the web, gndcampaign.org. So who are your heroes? Uh, just a couple last questions, because we've talked for about 30 minutes, and my objective on uh, Indian Point Blackout Week is to have interviews that are a little bit shorter than normal. 
you've been working at this for a while. You uh, clearly, as we sometimes say in Oklahoma, Texas, you have the bit in your teeth. You're really running with this issue, and I admire your passion for it. Who, who do you look to? Who are your heroes when you think about these issues? Well, this is sort of maybe a little bit standard for a pro-nuclear advocate, but someone who I continually go back to is Marie Curie. You know, she was sort of a pioneer of her field and in the face of fear mongering and misunderstanding about the technology, she persevered to see the beauty of what she was developing and what it could deliver for humanity. You know, I think the famous quote is, um, nothing in life is to be uh, feared uh, or it should be, shoot, I'm gonna mess this up, but now is the time that we should um, discover to fear less. Basically a call for understanding rather than cowering in the face of uncertainty um, so I, I would say she's my sort of spiritual hero in discovered a fear, life. discovered a fear less. I, I like that. And I For like now's the time we should learn more so that we may fear less. There so we go. We may, yeah, that's, I like that. And I like that, especially in light of what happened at Indian point, which I think was just, and I wrote it myself, it was just rank fear mongering. There was really, that was the key issue that they used to more than any other to get the plant closed. And I, I, I thought about it because I've talked to people since then. They said, well, yeah, people, you know, they should be concerned. I said, well, everything we might do in anything in the world has some potential for a downside. And I, you know, this person was talking about nuclear. I said, well, you know, when they put up nu wind turbines, people die falling off those wind turbines. They just, you know, that's part of, <laughs> it's a fairly high fatality rate, in fact, when you, in terms of risk on the job and so on. So anyway, uh, that, that's a great, so last question, Madison. Um, so you, you told me your heroes. So I can tell you, and you said you're mad and, and, and sad about what happened at Indian Point, and I am too, but so what gives you hope? I mean, a lot of things give me hope. I think maybe I'm audacious enough to think that we can actually achieve a green nuclear deal, but you know, today, the Surrey nuclear plant just got a 20 year life extension. So it will hopefully operate through 2053. Which, which um, plant was this? I'm sorry, forgive me. Surrey. And where uh, is that? I don't know that it's one. It's in Virginia. Okay. S-U-R-I? What is it? S-U-R-R-Y. S-U. Oh, sir. Okay. Surrey. Okay. I got you. Okay. Yep. Um, you know, last month, I believe Vogel began hot functional testing and they're eyeing a December online date for unit three like it was a long haul and i was very worried for a while that we would never see the day but it looks like it's going to be delivered as a project and people in southern um, area are going to get clean reliable electricity for decades so that gives me a lot of hope and then sort of uh more abstractly i just I don't know, again, maybe it's my eternal optimism, but I sense that we have in this country right now, a hunger for achievement that we, that there's sort of a tiredness of the divisiveness and this desire to come together to do big society scale things. And so I think that there's a real opportunity for common ground in nuclear. Like you said, there are tons of reasons to care about the existing fleet, um, whether it's cheap electricity, whether it's reliability and resiliency, whether it's environmental protection, whether it's, you know, honest work for really good pay. Um, I think nuclear presents this really unique opportunity for Americans to come together. And that gives me a lot of hope. Well said. Madison, well said. Um, well, let's end it there. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed this, uh, and, and, and really enjoyed hearing your view on all of these issues because I, you know, you clearly uh, thought a lot about it, and you put a lot of effort and and and, and time into it. So, uh, my guest, Madison Cherwinski, she is the executive director of a new nonprofit outfit called the Campaign for a Green Nuclear Deal. You can find them at gndcampaign.org. She's on Twitter at Maddie underscore Cherwinski. 
Um, I'm uh, anything else to add, Maddie, before I sign off? Um, just one question. Sure. What do you think about the green nuclear deal, Robert? On board? <laughs> I'm I'm all about it. I'm you know I'm adamantly pro nuclear. I want it to succeed. I, I'm I'm uh, I I want it to succeed. Let me, I'll just say that I I want I want this I these technologies to proliferate. We have too many people in the world living with either in in, in electricity poverty or without electricity at all. And in my view, if we're if we're serious about CO2 emissions, we have to get more serious about nuclear. And unfortunately, we haven't had that kind of seriousness. And I. Hope this, uh, like you, that this uh, senseless closure of Indian Point will will maybe uh, catalyze some movement on that. So, um, okay, yeah, good. All right, well, thanks to all of you in podcast land. Uh, this has been another episode of uh, the Power Hungry Podcast. We're going to have one or two more uh, uh, episodes of the Indian Point Blackout Week, so check back uh, for uh, some other great guests to talk about these issues uh, because – in, in my view, this should be an inflection point in how the U.S. thinks about nuclear energy. Um, so until next time, thanks for tuning in uh, over and out here.